cerebellum is called the little brain because it, it shares so many similarities with your cerebrum. For the maintenance of posture and equilibrium, cerebellum is a very important structure. And the number of nerve cells present in a cerebellum is supposed to be much more than the number of nerve cells present in the cerebrum. So now coming to cerebellum, cerebellum called as the little brain and it regulates mainly the tone of the muscle, the posture and balance and also it is very much needed for coordinating the different movements. Now, this is uh, the picture of the cerebellum you have here. This is the cerebellum and you can see the brain stem which comprises of the midbrain pons and the medulla and the cerebellum is connected to the midbrain by the superior cerebellar peduncle and the cerebellum is connected to the pons by the middle cerebellar peduncle and the cerebellum is connected to the medulla by the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And you look at the size of the brain and the cerebellum, the cerebellum comprises of only 10% of the whole weight of the cerebrum. So we go to whatever I have explained with the figure. Let's put it in a more order way. The cerebellum is connected to the midbrain through the superior cerebellar peduncle, to the pons through the middle cerebellar peduncle, and to the medulla through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The red lines which was connecting the orange colored cerebellum to the brain stem. Now, if you look at the cerebellar, the superior cerebellar peduncle, which we also call it as the brachium conjunctivitum, and here you can see that these all these tracks enter the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle. You have the cerebellotectal tract, the dentatothalamic tract, dentatorubral tract and the cerebellotegmental tract. These tracts make an entry through the superior cerebellar peduncle and through the middle cerebellar peduncle, we call it as the brachium pontus, the pontocerebellar tract makes an entry into the cerebellum through it. Now through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, which we call it as a restiform body, these many tracts makes an entry, the cerebellorreticular tract, the vestibulocerebellar tract, the olivocerebellar tract, the aquocerebellar tract, the trigeminocerebellar tract, cerebellospinal tract and the spinal cerebellar tract. This is how the cerebellum is getting connected to the other parts of the nervous system through its three peduncles, the superior cerebellar peduncle, the middle cerebellar peduncle and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now, let's look at the functional divisions and the different functions of cerebellum. Now, functionally, the cerebellum is divided into the vestibulosperi cerebellum, the spinocerebellum and the cerebrocerebellum. I would want to make this more clear through a picture. You have the picture here. This blue color on the side is the cerebrocerebellum and the center part is the spinocerebellum and the center and this blue color one we call it as the vermis and this orange color part in the center which seems to be placed a little, a little detached we call it as the vestibular cerebellum or the flocular nodula lobe. So these are the three parts of the cerebellum and here in this picture you can see that even the, uh, the, the function is written here. I think this would make things very clear for you. Though, so the cerebrocerebellum, we also call it as the neocerebellum. You can see that it is required. That is basically the motor and the pre-motor cortices and it is required for the motor planning. Any motor activity to be planned, you require the action of cerebrocerebellum to be done. Now, you have this part, the spinocerebellum. Center part is the vermis and the two corner part, we call it as a paravermal zone and all the lateral descent Descending pathways actually pass through the sparavermal zone and the, uh, the medial descending pathways you can see comes down through this vermis. The lateral descending pathways occupy the paravermal zone and the medial descending pathways uh, pass through the vermis. And uh, this uh, basically the lateral both the that means the, the paravermal zone and the vermal zone through which the lateral and the medial descending pathways uh, pass through you can put it as this part takes care of the control of the skilled movements in your body. Now you have the uh, the flocular nodular nerve or the vestibular nucleus the vestibular cerebellum which takes care of balance and your eye movements. So that's about the functional divisions of cerebellum with we had even talked in brief about the functions of the cerebellum. 
Now, let's go. Whatever I have explained with the figure, let's put it a little more detail. The vestibulo cerebellum or the archi cerebellum, that's what the part which is down, which was taking care of balance and the eye movements, it's extensive and reciprocal connection with the vestibular nuclei. That means that particular part of the cerebellum is extensively connected to the vestibular nuclei and it is through that connection it is able to maintain uh, the balance. So now that is the oldest part of the cerebellum and it is mainly concerned with equilibrium and it consists of the flocular nodular lobe. So that's about the vestibulo cerebellum. Now we have the spino cerebellum. We also call it as a paleo cerebellum. It consists of the vermis, the center part, which controls the posture, and the two corner part, we called it as a paravermal zone, which influences the distal limb muscle. Basically, if you look at all this is related to the maintenance of posture and equilibrium. And where does it receive impulse from this uh, vermal and the paravermal zone, which, which makes up the spino cerebellum, it receives proprioceptive and other sensory inputs from all the body parts through the spinal cord. The descending pathways uh, are, are descending down in the lateral, uh, the vermal zone and the uh, paravermal zone. So, which is actually receiving proprioceptive. So, proprioceptive impulses, you have the proprioceptors, uh, the receptors for proprioception present in the muscles and the joints. Then you have the two sides, the blue color one, the cerebrocerebellum. cerebellum. It is also called as a neocerebellum and it consists of the two main cerebellar hemispheres and it's involved in planning and programming of the motor movements. Now, so here we have the functional anatomy where you need to know in detail about these cellular structures present. So if you look at the functional histology of the cerebellum, you can see that the outermost, you have the molecular layer, then you have the middle Purkinje cell layer, and then you have the granular cell layer. In this molecular cell layer, you have the basket cells and the stellate, all these are neurons. So the basket cells and the stellate cells are present in the uh, in the molecular cell layer and then in the center you have the Purkinje cell layer. Naturally the name itself tells you the Purkinje cell layer contains Purkinje cells. Then you have the innermost granular cell layer which contains the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers. So let's go. We need to really uh, get to know how these, You, if you look at the picture you can see that all these different cells, the mossy fibers, the climbing fibers, the Purkinje cells, the stellate cells, basket cells, all of them either through their dendrites or axons are connected with each other. They are all interconnected. In that you need to have a little better picture. So let's go one by one. You know that the cerebellum is divided into the outer cortex. Now this outer cortex consists of the outer molecular layer, Purkinje layer and the inner granule layer. So all these three, these three together makes up the uh, the outer cortical layer of the cerebellum and this inner part contains the deep cerebellar nuclei. So this that is you know inside this here you would have the deep cerebellar nuclei and the deep cerebellar nuclei once we finish discussing the different cellular layers of this molecular Purkinje layer and the granule cell layer we will be going to, into the discussions of the deep cerebellar nuclei. Now here you have it, the molecular layer if you see, do you remember I have told you it contains the basket cells and the stellate cells. I'll just go back to the figure once and reinforce it. I'm talking about this layer, the molecule layer, which can you see you have the basket cells here and you have the stellate cells there. That is what we are talking about and what are they the basket cells and the stellate cells? They're actually the interneurons. Now let's go to the Purkinje cell layer. Purkinje cell layer that in, in between the, the deep nuclear layer and the molecular layer, you had a purple color layer, the Purkinje cell layer. I would again go back to the previous figure. This, the blue one, as we are talking about. This is the Purkinje cell layer. Now, let's see what, what is contained in the Purkinje cell layer. There you have the Purkinje cells. And what is speciality of Purkinje cells? They are the largest neurons and they have got a very extensive dendritic branches. The dendrites of the Purkinje cells are really extensive. They spread and branch with many other neurons. And the dendrites of Purkinje cells 
cells would enter into the molecule layer. The molecule layer was lying over the Purkinje cell layer. So the extensive dendrites of the Purkinje cells, if you see, you can see them entering into the molecular layer and the axons of the interneurons of the molecular layer project to the dendrites of the Purkinje cells. That means you had the basket cell cells and the stellate cells in the molecular layer. So the axons of those basket cells and the stellate cells, you can see that will go and project to uh, the Purkinje cell dendrites. So the dendrites of the Purkinje cell, which is very extensive, is actually synapsing with the axons of the basket cells and the stellate cells of the molecular layer. And it receives inputs directly from the climbing fibers. You have climbing fibers. So Purkinje cell is getting information from the climbing fibers also. And only cells that project from the cortex of the cerebellum to the deep cerebellar nuclei is a Purkinje cell. That's why we have told that it's the largest neuron. It's the only cell which is projecting from the cerebral cortex to the deep cerebellar nuclei. And it's a connecting link between the cerebellar cortex and the deep cerebellar nuclei. This is a very important point to be remembered. It's this largest neuron which is a Purkinje cell which is the only cell which is getting which is connecting or which is a connecting link between the cerebellar cortex and the deep cerebellar nuclei. Now coming to the next uh, this uh, orange color layer we have the granular cell layer. It contains the granule cells you have it here, you, it, you, uh, the granule cell and the Golgi cells. And this granule cell and the Golgi cell, like the basket cells and the stellate cells are interneurons. Basket cells and stellate cells are present in the molecular layer, whereas the Golgi cell and the granule cell is interneuron which is present in the granule cell layer. And it projects to the granule cells and it modifies the granular cell input. And it receives inputs from the mossy fibers. Can you see you have the mossy fibers? Uh, the, the detailed uh, figure is coming up and it projects to the Purkinje cells, basket cells, stellate cells and Golgi cells via the parallel fibers. Can you see the parallel fibers here? So basically what the understanding you will need to have is all these cells of the different cellular layer are connected with each other through their axons of dendrite. And it's only the Purkinje cell which is actually connected, uh, which is actually connecting the cerebellar cortex to the deep cerebellar nuclei. So now coming to the, so we have finished discussing the deep cerebellar cortex, the different layers and the different cells which are present. Now we go to the deep cerebellar nuclei. Now which are the four deep cerebellar nuclei? You have the nucleus fastigius here. Can you see this brown one here? That is the, let me just take out that dot. Now this, the most medial one is the, uh, the nucleus fastigius. Then just Addition to that, the blue color one is the nucleus globosus and then you have this green color strip which is called as the nucleus emboliformis and then this red color one is the nucleus or the dentatus nucleus. So the deep four deep four cerebellar nuclei are nucleus fastigius, nucleus globosus, nucleus emboliformis and nucleus dentatus. Now we are going to go a little more into each nucleus. So let's first discuss about nucleus fastigius. Nucleus fastigius is his middle. Can you see two? The most medial one, the brown small one. Now it is present in the deep vermal portion of the cerebellum and the nucleus globosus and emboliformis. Where is it? The globosus and emboliformis, this blue color one and the green color one. Together we call it as the nucleus intopositus. Now, the nucleus dentatus you have, that is this red color one, and it is present in the hemispheric portion of the cerebellum. The dentatus is present in the hemispheric portion, and the, uh, the fastigius is present in the center part, the vermal portion, para vermal portion, paravermal portion, and then you had the, uh, the, 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 the lateral uh, part of the cerebellum. Now coming to the cerebellar connections, let's see what are the inputs cerebellum is receiving from which structures of, you know, different higher centers is cerebellum receiving its input. So the first point gives you an, a reply for that. It receives somatosensory inputs from all the parts of the body 
and the sensory modalities including special so that means from everywhere both the sensory inputs and all the somatosensory inputs everything all input is reaching the cerebellum and now let's see what the cerebellar efferents are what are the fibers which are coming into the cerebellum first you have the vestibulo cerebellar tract that is the first efferent which the cerebellum is receiving cerebellum receives impulse directly from the vestibular apparatus and also from the vestibular nuclei so that's about the vestibular cerebellar tract it's very easy to remember because it word itself if you remember the word you know from from the vestibular uh, so vestibular cerebellar so you know the termination is in the cerebellum so vestibulo you need to split it as split it as it's coming from the vestibular apparatus and also from the vestibular nuclei and number 2 you have the dorsal spinocerebellar tract now this dorsal spinocerebellar tract it conveys proprioceptive and exteroceptive impulses from different parts of the body from different parts of the body two sensations the proprioceptive and the exteroceptive impulses are being delivered through the dorsal spinocerebellar tract to the cerebellum and the third one the ventrospinal cerebellar tract it conveys proprioceptive and exteroceptive impulses from different parts of the body so uh, again we continue with the efferents you have the cuneo cerebellar tract the fourth one so it's originating from the lateral cuneate nucleus and where is this lateral cuneate nucleus present it's in the caudal medulla and what does it do it conveys proprioceptive inputs from the head and the neck region so basically if you look at the kind of message these tracks are conveying to the cerebellum you get to know that it is all related to the maintenance of posture and equilibrium then you have the fifth one the tecto cerebellar tract which is conveying visual information from the superior colliculus and auditory information from the inferior colliculus to the cerebellum so the visual inputs and the auditory inputs are reaching the cerebellum through the tecto cerebellar tract now again we continue i just missed on the number where we stopped okay there you had the fifth tract now the sixth efferent input is through the ponto cerebellar tract now ponto cerebellar end the cerebellum now what is this ponto the impulse is reaching from the motor cortex and it is reaching the cerebellum via the pontine nucleus so that ponto is for pontine nucleus so from the pontine nucleus to the cerebellum but where is this pontine nucleus receiving information from it is receiving it from the cerebral cortex now the seventh one you have the olivo cerebellar tract where the proprioceptive inputs from the whole body it reaches in it reaching the cerebellum from the inferior olivary nucleus and this from where is this inferior olivary uh, nucleus see olivo cerebello uh, cerebellar tract from the inferior olivary nucleus to the cerebellum now this message what the inferior olivary nucleus is delivering to the cerebellum from where is it receiving input it is receiving it from the vestibular system spinal cord and the cerebral cortex it's this three places vestibular system spinal cord and the cerebral cortex the inferior olivary nucleus receives its input and that input is being delivered to the cerebellum now so that's it with the uh, the seven tracks or the efferent pathways we discussed through which the cerebellum was delivering its uh, cerebellum uh, cerebellum uh, was getting uh, 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 uploaded with information from different parts of the body now let's see the inputs to the cerebellum is actually reaching the cerebellum th uh, through three ways the mossy fibers climbing fibers and other inputs now here you get an idea here so you have the cortex here you have the cerebellar cortex hemispheric zone paravermal zone and the vermis center vermis paravermal zone and then you have the hemispheric zone so you can see that from cortex the green fiber the impulse the descending tracks Uh, continues as the pyramidal tract and then you can see that all these tracts the different pathways the reticulospinal tract the vestibulospinal tract rubrospinal tract all of them you can see fibers from the cerebellum is reaching that is what this connections is showing you can you see from the hemispheric zone the two sides 
you can see impulse is reaching the deep nuclei, the dentate nuclei, and from there you can see it gets connected to the thalamus, and thalamus is sending impulse to the cortex, so cerebellum is influencing whatever sensations is being carried in the pyramidal tract. Now you look here, from the paravermal zone, uh, impulses is reaching the uh, interpositus nucleus, from there to the vestibular nuclei, and it influences the rubrospinal uh, tract. Then you can see impulse from the paravermal zone which is reaching the fastidious nuclei through the reticular nuclei, how it influences the vestibulospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract and influence here is coming from through the Purkinje cells through the deep cerebellar nuclei. So this gives a picture on how these tracts the descending tracts are being influenced by the inputs coming from the deep cerebellar nuclei. So here, and, and, and there is an important thing to be noted here. Can you see this? Uh, BC is the basket cell, uh, the stellate cells, and the Golgi cells. And this blue one is a Purkinje cell. And this red one is a deep nuclei. So here, what is important is, see, this Purkinje cell has got an inhibitory influence over the deep cerebellar nuclei. But can you see, it's a plus sign here. It's a minus here. And it is a plus sign here. So you'll have to read this as, in spite of the inhibitory inputs from the Purkinje cell, the output from the deep nuclei is always excitatory, is the point which this is. This is the way the cerebellum works. Even though the Purkinje cell input is always inhibitory, output from the deep nuclei is always excitatory. Now, coming to cerebellar disorders, the disease is affecting. So, we are going to discuss under different headings. What will happen if the this hemispheres are affected? What will happen if the central part of the cerebr cerebellum is affected? What will happen when the flocular nodular lobe is, absent, uh, uh, is uh, affected? So, disease is affecting the flocular nodular lobe, the down part. Uh, uh, there, you can see that it will result in abnormalities in maintaining the equilibrium. Flocular nodular lobe of the cerebellum affected. What is affected will be the equilibrium. I think that would, uh, I'll just take out what I have marked. So, for now, what is an example you are going to give? Stimulation of the vestibular cerebellum leads to motion sickness. Now, uh, intractable motion sickness can be cured by selective removal of the flocular nodular lobe and the effects of lesions of one side cerebellar hemisphere would manifest on the ipsilateral side of the body. See the cerebellar disorders, the features, we'll be going in detail but this would give you a general idea on what kind of lesion is going to produce, what kind of features in an individual. So, the cerebellar disorders, if you look at, these are the features of the cerebellar disorder. There is no paralysis involved when there is a lesion in the cerebellum because the voluntary movements are intact. Why there is no paralysis? All the voluntary movements of the individual is intact, though it is defective. It will be defective voluntary movements, but the person is able to do his voluntary movements. Now, if you look at reflexes, reflexes are normal, except that at some times you can see that the knee jerk when you try to elicit the knee jerk will be pendular. Now number three, there is no sensory deficit. It's only the motor component which is getting affected. Now fourth one you have hypotonia which is a usual feature because muscle tone is getting affected here. Ataxia is there. Inability to carry out long term adjustments in motor response. Any, any motor activity for the person with a cerebellar to, uh, lesion to undergo a long-term adjustment, it may not be possible. Now, seventh one, there is defect in the vestibular ocular reflex which leads to pathological nystagmus, involuntary movement of the eyeball. So, we continue with that. Now, this motor deficit manifests in the form of ataxia. 
You can see when the person is made to. So there are tests which assess ataxia. We'll be going into that detail. The cerebellar, uh, the, the, the function tests are there. There is defect in the coordination due to the errors in the rate, range, force and direction of movement. So whenever a person, see a person with cerebellar disorder, he cannot assess the rate or the range of the movement. For example, when I have a pen on this hand, when I need to pick it up with my other hand, I exactly know my cerebellum exactly tells me what is the force or the rate which with I need to move my hand and what is the distance I move with hand and I actually land here and pick up this pen. But a person with cerebellar disorder, he is not able to assess the rate, range, force and the direction of movement. He would even overshoot. If I want to pick this uh, pen, a person with cerebellar disorder, I would actually extend or I would stop halfway through. I wouldn't be able to assess the range or the rate of movement. Now, it's very temporary if only the cerebellar cortex is involved. Now it becomes if the deep cerebellar nuclei is also involved in this lesion, then all these defects are going to be permanent. Now ataxia is there. Now ataxia would manifest in the form of drunken gait. The person with cerebellar disorder with ataxia would walk, uh, uh, he's not able to walk in a straight line. He would walk as though, as you know, as though he is drunk. That is what we call as a drunken gait. When how do you define a drunken gait? It is the unsteady and a wide base. Uh, gate. Now there is scanning speech, ataxia because ataxia is affecting the muscles of speech also. So he would start san scanning the syllables as he uh, speaks. So speech, speak. So that is what you call as the scanning of the speech. Now dysmetria is there. It is able, it's in the inability. Whenever the cerebellar uh, lesion is there, there is inability to measure the length or the distance. So what happens is an attempt to touch one uh, object leads the hands to overshoot. So that is what you call as the past pointing. Exactly the example I gave you, the pen is here. I try to pick it up. If there is a cerebellar lesion, there is past pointing. I would overshoot. I'm not able to uh, ray, uh, the to, uh, to, uh, to understand the distance or the rate of the movement which needs to be performed. Now there is intention tremor. Why there is intention tremor in cerebellar lesion? You can see that the hand would oscillate. What is intention tremor? When you try to do an activity, you can see that the hand oscillates back and forth. Why is it happening? This is because due to dysmetria. Dysmetria is there. The person with cerebellar lesion is not able to judge the the length or the distance of movement. So what happens is the corrective measures are immediately started by the body. So moment this corrective measures are start, what happens is the hand would overshoot in the opposite direction because you are with the person with cerebellar lesion when he knows that he needs to pick this pen there is dysmetria. So what happens is body starts with the corrective measures and what is the result of the corrective measure is instead of my hand moving like this, the hand would shoot in the opposite direction. Now this repeated overshoot and recorrection is actually resulting in the back and forth movement of the hand which we call as the intention tremor and uh, it, it, it's only intention tremor. When the person is in rest, there is no tremor. The tremor is rest is absent. Now, continuing with cerebellar disorders, you have something called as the rebound phenomenon. We'll have to, please don't try to write it in your own words. Try to go by these words which have been put here. Rebound phenomenon is inability to put on break for an ongoing, ongoing movement. He starts to perform an activity, but he's not able to really stop. He's not able to break that movement. Now, uh, example is when a patient is asked to flex his limbs against resistance, resistance is given and uh, it's asked to, uh, the patient is asked to flex the limb, what happens is, and, uh, and then asked to stop immediately by withdrawing resistance. So, uh, the, uh, the, he is, uh, you uh, hold the patient's hand, you give resistance and you ask him to uh, flex the limbs. But you ask him to, the command is given to stop flexing and you immediately withdraw the uh, withdraw the resistance. What happens is he won't be able to stop. He cannot stop. Rather, his arm moves with a wider arc. So that's what is the rebound phenomenon is where the person is, a person's inability to break an ongoing movement is seen.
and then you have the adidocokinasia. Now, what is this adidocokinasia? It's the inability to perform alternate movements rapidly. A simple example, example is if you ask the patient to perform supination and pronation rapidly, he wouldn't be able to do it. That is what it means. Now, then you have the decomposition and movement. What is What do you mean by decomposition of movement? It's the inability to perform a movement that involves more than one joint simultaneously. Any movement which requires the involvement of more than one joint, the uh, patient wouldn't be able to perform. The cerebellar patient dissects such complex movement, so performs movement in each joint slowly and separately. Any movement, let it be the way he walks to anything, where many joints are involved, he would walk like how you have seen a robot is walking. So, where multiple joints are involved, he is not, uh, he wouldn't be able to perform. That's why you call it as decomposition of movements. Now coming to the, so we have just finished discussing with the disorders, cerebellar disorders. Now let's see how the cerebellar function can be assessed. So you have many clinical tests to detect the cerebellar functions. First, we have tests for coordination. Now for upper limb and lower limb, we have separate tests. For the upper limb, what do we have? For upper limb, we have the finger nose test and also making circle. There are a lot of tests. I've just taken out the two important ones. The finger nose test. The person is asked to uh, get his hand and touch his uh, 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 nose. With the finger, you need to touch the nose, which he wouldn't be able to do if there is a lesion with the cerebellum and making circles in the air. All these are the tests for cerebellum for the upper limb. Now, it comes to lower limb, you have the kneel heel uh, test. With the fee, uh, heel, the person is asked to touch the knee. So again, that wouldn't happen if there is a cerebellar lesion and walking on a straight line. That also is not possible for a patient with cerebellar disorder. Now, there are tests to uh, assess the postural stability. So how do you assess postural stability? The patient or the person is asked to stand erect with uh, feet close together but eyes open eyes open, you ask the patient to put the feet together and then the person is made to stand. If he is not able to do it, it's a clear indication of a cerebellar disorder. Now the assessment of various aspects of ataxia as described above is actually the test for the cerebellar function. Now let's come to the summary of cerebellum. So cerebellum has a vast, refined, intricate internal circuitry. You remember we discussed about the molecular cell layer, Purkinje cell layer, the deep layer, then you had the deep cerebellar nuclei and you how extensively the mossy fibers, the basket cells, stellate cells, Purkinje cells, climbing fibers, parallel fibers, all of them is what we are actually referring to an intricate internal circuitry of the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum, it receives sensory efferents. From where is it receiving? From the peripheral sensory receptors, from the brain stem, cerebral cortex. And then what does the cerebellum do? Cerebellum will process it in its internal circuitry. And the output is coming from where? The output is coming from the Purkinje cell and it is inhibitory to the cerebellar nuclei. But this was, the, I see this point three and four, I'm to, uh, I'm, we are discussing about that figure what I showed you. Purkinje cell which is in, uh, inhibitory to the deep nuclei, but the output of the deep nuclei is always excitatory. So the output is from deep nuclei which is excitatory and it projects to other motor control area of the brain stem and also higher up. Now if, you, now, if you just try to uh, sum up the functional part of cerebellum, cerebellum is involved in motor, the planning of voluntary movements. It provides timing signals to ongoing voluntary muscular activity and it plays a very important role in muscle tone, posture and equilibrium. So that's about the cerebellum in brief. The divisions, the classification, the functions, disorders, it's, it's complicated internal circuitry, cerebellar disorders and the function and the test to assess cerebellum has all been discussed in detail here.